and welcome to my talk titled Learn and Contribute to Open Source by Writing Blog Posts. Now, just before we jump into things, just a bit about myself. My name is Ivan Zujek, and I've been a freelance Drupal developer for around 12 years. I think a couple of years I was full-time, but most of the time I've been a Drupal uh, developer. And I always love to look at my um, user profile on Drupal.org because I actually realized that my account has been on Drupal.org for 13 years and one week. It's probably now 13 years and four weeks, which is kind of scary because my, my account's a teenager, technically. And especially because I've got two small kids, it's, 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 it's scary to know that my account is older than all my kids and existed way before them. But in the last 13 years and one week, I've always tried to find ways to contribute to the Drupal community because the community has given me a lot. Now, without Drupal, I wouldn't be standing up here, of course, because this is a Drupal conference, and I wouldn't have a career, and I wouldn't have all of made, made, made all of the friends that I have here at Drupal South. So, I always try to find ways to contribute. Now, when it comes to contributing to Drupal or any type of open source project, you may be thinking, the only way to contribute is by writing content, correct? Oh, sorry, writing code. Correct? Well, one thing I've realized is that with open source projects, the code is just one little small part. For a project to be successful, you need to promote it, okay? You need good documentation. Now, who here has searched for something in Drupal and then found the documentation page and there's a little thing saying, oh, documentation needs to be written, okay? We've all gone through it. In Drupal, and any type of open source content or, or open source project, if it's not promoted and if it's lacking documentation, then no one's going to use it. You can have the best code in the world, but if, but if you don't have those things, you have nothing, okay? So let me talk about a few ways you can contribute in non-technical ways. Now, the first way, as I just mentioned, promotion. Now, to bring this back to Drupal, I, rem I remember just recently discovering a module called Rabbit Hole, okay? Now, I don't know if, you, if any of you have used that module, but essentially what that module does is that it stops people from getting access to the entity canonical URL. So you can actually set it up to stop people from going to node slash one, two, three. Now, the name is terrible, okay, in my, in my, in my opinion, in my opinion, because rabbit hole doesn't mean anything. You cannot find it in a simple Google search by saying, how do I stop access to a canonical page? The only way I figured it out, or I found out about the module, is, is, is that somebody wrote a blog post about it. So, so if you want to contribute in a non-technical or, or coder way, you can, you can promote the project. Another way of contributing is to organize meetups. Now, you don't have to organize a whole meetup from, from, from start to end. You can actually join the organizing committee and, and help them order pizzas. When I used to live in Sydney, because I've moved out of Sydney, um, I was part of the organizing committee for the Sydney Drupal meetup. And it was my job to find speakers, of course, but there was about three or four of us, but, but every meetup I would order pizza. So that was kind of my thing. So I would jump on the Domino's side. I knew exactly where to get the cheaper pizza because it's right down at the bottom because the expensive ones are up at the top. And I would organize pizzas I'll, and um, they will get delivered. I'll go downstairs and pick them up and organize all of that. So that was my way of um, helping out. Another way is volunteer at camps. Now, I am volunteering here. I'm helping out. And when you volunteer at a camp, it's a great way to meet people, especially if you have joined a new open source community. So about a year ago, I went to my first WordCamp in Australia. And I didn't know anyone there, okay? I've been doing Drupal for 12 years. So I decided to volunteer. And so I was thrown up the front on the registration desk. I met a lot of people, and that was a great way just to break the ice. Because if I didn't volunteer, I'd be in the corner on, on my phone during the, you know, the, the afternoon tea, doing nothing and not socializing. But by volunteering, it got me out of my show and I was just, and I could talk to anyone. And another way, and another way you can contribute, and this is um, specific for Drupal, is offer support in the issue queue. Now, 
I'm sure all of us have installed a module, realized it doesn't do something, or we found a bug, and we jumped in the issue queue to ask for help. Now, a lot of, now, a, a lot of the times, this can be just a simple, oh, can this module do X? And the answer is yes or no. So you, so you don't have to write code. So if you want to help out, just jump into the issue queue and um, answer a few support requests so that the maintainers can just sit down and write code. And another way you can contribute, and it's the whole point of this session, is you can contribute by writing content. And this is my way of contributing to Drupal or any type of open source project, and that is to write content about it. Now, just a bit of history about myself. So I've been writing for the last six years about Drupal, and I've been producing blog posts, recording videos, um, producing free courses over at webwash.net. Now, this may sound like a free plug, which it kind of is, but I just want to show you and talk about my experiences in running this site. So, over the last six or so years, I have written over just under 180 blog posts, which isn't that much, because if I was to actually stick to my schedule of writing one a week, it would have been way more. Um, I have replied to over 900 comments, and on the site in total, there's 2002, over 2,200 comments, and that is people asking for help. And the site also has free courses, and there's over 500 enrolled students, and I've also got a free Udemy course on udemy.com, which is a courses platform, and there's over 10,000 enrolled students. Now, yes, that sounds like a lot, 10,000, but you would realize quick with courses, a lot of people enroll, very few actually spend more, like go past the third or fourth video. They're like, they're like gym memberships. It's, you know, it feels great to get it, but then you never really finish it. Um, but it is a good number. I was actually surprised because because I created this course and forgot about it, and then, hey, you know, I've got 10,000 active students, crazy. And then I've also got a YouTube, um, uh, a YouTube channel with over, I think it's over 100 um, videos. So as you can see, this is my way of contributing to Drupal by, by producing great content that, that will help people learn how to use Drupal. So in this session, I want to share with you how I write blog posts and how you can start as well. And I do hope that you are convinced to get out there, spin up a blog, and start writing yourselves. So before we get into the technical details, well, there's actually not much technical details in this, in this session, but let's talk about why you want to write. So why go through all the efforts of writing a blog post? Now, when I say blog post, this can be text or video, okay? So, Think of it like this, like why produce content, okay? So let's talk about the benefits that you get as an actual writer, that you get by documenting and publishing content. Well, the first one is you'll get a better understanding of the topic if you teach it, okay? I'm sure you've heard of the saying that if you want to learn about something, you know, teach somebody about it. And I know that when I want to write about a module, I have to look at it from multiple angles because I know people are gonna ask questions about, oh, oh, does this module work with this theme? Does it work with that? And also, if I wanna learn about a topic in Drupal, I force myself to write about it because that is a great way to learn something and also get something out of it by producing content. Now, another benefit is you'll become a better communicator because if you are used to putting your thoughts out in text or in video, when you are working on a project, you'll, you will be able to explain things better to others. Now, I've been building Drupal sites for a very long time, and on every single project, I need to explain to the client what a block is, because their definition of a block is very different to mine. Their definition of a module is very different to mine. So communication is key, and I, and I would even say, and, I, and I'll put in this extra note just yesterday, but. How many times have you started a project, you finished it, you hand it to the client, and they go, oh, I assumed it was going to work like this. And that's because they didn't quite understand what you were talking about. So communication is key. And by getting into the habit of writing, you will be able to, you will be able to, to conceptualize these concepts in your head better. And 
Another benefit of writing is that you will get all of these secondary skills. Now, these are just some of the, second, the secondary skills that I've got. Now, I'm not an expert in any of these, but these are just some random skills that I got by producing content. The first one, of course, is content marketing. That's pretty basic. If you write any type of content, it's content marketing. Another one is, is SEO, and, here, and a couple of years ago here I thought all SEO people were sleazy, but now I do actually take note of certain keywords that I want to rank for in Google. So then I kind of adjust my title in a clean way, not in a black hat type of way, but in a nice clean way. Now, another thing I've started to do is social media and email marketing. Now, I would recommend you focus on email marketing, not social media marketing, because you get a bit of bang for your buck. Um, I mean, the click-through the, the click rate for social media posts is absolutely terrible, but email marketing is the way to go. And, and if you're going to produce video, well, you'll learn how to produce video. And also, I've done live streams and webinars, and I've also learned how to set up, what is it, OBS and do streaming on multiple platforms using a third-party service. Now, if all you want to do is write content and not worry about all this stuff, that's fine, okay? Because if, if what you write is popular enough and users need it, you should automatically appear at the top of Google, honestly. Like, I've probably spent a lot of time trying to rank better for pages um, for certain keywords, and then I see other blog posts that just have better content and rank way better. So at the end of the day, if you just write great content, you're going to rank pretty well. Now, um, one thing that I've enjoyed doing lately, or the last couple of years, is producing videos. And so I've learned all these, all these skills about recording video, fixing up audio, how to, how to use the parametric equalizer, which I've got no idea about, I'll just Google it. Um, you know, I've learned how to remove background noises, add a bit of bass to my voice, and also edit intros and outros and things like that. Now, the final benefit I'll, I'll mention is you will become an authority. Now, now, this may sound a bit marketing-esque, which it kind of is, but if you write enough content and people read it, you will eventually be seen as an authority. And this is great if you're a freelancer and you want to pr promote a personal brand, or if you're a company and also you want to promote your company. And, and for me, I do like meeting new people at camps like here or conferences and they come up to me and say, you know, thanks for um, producing the videos and the blog posts because it's good for me to know that my content's been appreciated because um, writing content can sometimes be a lonely experience and you don't get that feedback to know, well, are people actually enjoying it or is it actually useful? And it's good to know when people come up and say, oh, you know, your content helped me out. So. So that's some of the benefits you get as a writer. Now let's quickly talk about the benefits you get as a reader or the end user, okay? So what are the benefits for the reader? Now this is probably obvious, but what happens when you hit a roadblock when you're building a site? Well, you would Google it or you would um, Bing it or DuckDuckGo it, whichever search engine you use, but essentially you will try and find a problem to your solution, uh, uh, find a solution to your problem, sorry, um, by simply Googling it. And then, hopefully, and then, you know, you search for something, you have a look at some of the results, and you look for a solution to fix your problem. And this is where you can contribute to an open source project just by writing blog posts, because you are helping somebody get over or get past a roadblock. And this is huge, okay? Because I know myself, I have had problems, you know, I still Google random things about Drupal 8, and I've been using Drupal 8 since it was released. And often, I would find a blog post with just a few sentences that help me out, and straight away I can move on to the, to the next thing. And I do think that you can tell if an open source project is, is um, healthy if people are willing to write content about it, because it shows people are willing to spend tens of hours writing content. So, how do you start? Okay, so we've talked about the benefits as a reader, as a writer. So, how do you start? Well, it's actually pretty straightforward um, how you start. The first thing you want to do is pick, a is pick a platform, okay? You want to create a website. If you don't have a website already, go ahead and create 
a website. Now, there are a lot of platforms out there that you can choose. Now, try and use a self-hosted platform. Don't use medium.com, okay, because you're not in control of your data, and that's important, okay? We always talk about, you know, Drupal's, Drupal is an open source platform. You have access to the code. You also want to have full control over the content that you will spend hours and hours and hours writing. So avoid using platforms like Medium, com because they they can just change and then all of a sudden they force a paywall in front and so now you have all this great content which is stopped by a paywall and so so here I've got a list of just a few platforms you can use to host your website okay the first one obviously is Drupal um, the second one is uh, WordPress that that I've heard is great for uh, blogging another one which is which has become popular is Gatsby which is a JavaScript static site generator. And if you want to host for free, you can use GitHub or GitLab pages. That is all for free, okay? Now, I do have to make a, I do have to make a bit of a confession. Webwash.net is a WordPress site, okay? It's not a Drupal site. And even though I write about Drupal, well, pretty much every blog post is about Drupal. Now, I decided to move over to WordPress purely because Maintaining a Drupal site takes a lot of time and effort. And I decided this when it was still, when it, the site was on Drupal 7, and I didn't want to migrate it to Drupal 8. And the reason for that is I just wanted to focus on writing content, not managing a Drupal site. I manage 10 Drupal sites, you know. I've, I've had to wake up at 4 in the morning because there was a security release and quickly update all of these sites with a team of people um, remotely. It's not fun, okay? Now, of course, you know, WordPress has its, has its security uh, releases, of course, but I didn't want to spend time maintaining a Drupal site. And also, with WordPress, you have access to an ecosystem of plugins where you can just buy a theme and you've got a nice theme. You can buy a course, in, uh, you can you, you can buy a course platform, and you have a nice course platform on your site. With Drupal, you have to do all that yourself, and I just didn't have the time to do that. But one thing I want to stress: okay, write whatever you are comfortable in. Okay. Now, when, when I decided to move to WordPress, I thought, oh, you know, are people going to send me snarky comments saying, why have you moved the site over to WordPress? You know, why aren't you using Drupal? But honestly, no one cared. And if you want to write in Markdown and you hate editors, well, then write in Markdown and use GitHub or GitLab pages. Even if you're going to write about WordPress, who cares? Just write what you're comfortable in because you don't want to have to force yourself to use a platform that you don't like because then you won't write anything. And the whole point is just to produce content. So just write whatever you're comfortable in and don't worry about the rest. Okay, so once you've decided on a platform and you want to start writing, you first need to figure out the topics you're going to write about. Okay? So how do you come up with ideas? Well, I've got a few, I, I've got a few tips right here. The first way to come up with ideas is to just write it out on paper. Okay? Simple. Um, if you're on a train or you're commuting somewhere, you have a pen and paper, just write down some ideas on a piece of paper. Another place where you can get some great ideas, and this is where I get a lot of my ideas, is while I'm building a Drupal site for a client, often I would estimate some, something will take half a day, but then I end up taking a day or two because you have to use a particular version of this module, you need to patch this, you need to configure this in views, you need to configure that somewhere else. And then I realized, oh, this took, took much longer than I thought. So, so if it confused me, then chances are it's going to confuse someone else. So that's a great way to just write down all those little issues that you've had in the past and then just make a blog post about that. So once you have your list, you want to compile it somewhere, okay? This is pretty straightforward stuff. You know, you have a, you have a bunch of ideas, you want to put it somewhere. Then you can use a note as any type of note-taking tool. Um, I started using Notion, which is a new note-taking tool. And you can see that's probably a screenshot of a stuff that I want to write about. I've also got stuff in Google Sheets as well. But I will stress one thing. Try and consolidate all your ideas into a single place. I've got three or four Google Sheets. I've got stuff in Evernote. I've got stuff in Todoist. I've got stuff in Google Keep. I've got probably stuff in... Um, Microsoft OneNote, I've got it everywhere. So you want to try and keep things consolidated in a single place. And so once you have all your ideas, 
So once you have an idea for a blog post, it's time to sit down and write. And this is the hardest part, mind you, in my opinion. Now, for some people, writing may not be a pleasant experience. I know for me, I, I can bear, you know, I don't sit down and, you know, get into the zone straight away for writing. Sometimes it's kind of, you know, I need to smash my head against a keyboard just to get ideas out. So here is something that I recommend when you start writing. Come up with a nice blog post structure, okay? And stick with it because this will help you write blog posts very quickly. So here is my structure, okay? I've got an introduction, body, and summary. It's pretty straightforward, you know, nothing groundbreaking at this point. Well, there's nothing really groundbreaking at all, but it's just simple. You have an introduction, you have a body, and you have a summary. Now, in the summary, I first, sorry, in the introduction, I first explain the problem, okay? Now, that can be 200 words, it can be 100 words, it can be 50 words, okay? I use as many words as necessary. Sometimes I try and force myself to write 100 words when something can be explained in a sentence. Then I just write it in a sentence. You know, don't use too many words, okay? So you first, um, you first explain the problem. Then, you offer, then I would offer a solution, okay? I would recommend the best way of doing it. And then at the end, before we jump into things, I will let the reader know what they will learn. This way, the reader can quickly just skim the introduction, see if they want to read the rest, and if they don't want to learn, if they don't want to read the rest, they can just jump off and go to something else, okay? And, and this introduction works well for me. And then in the summary, okay, the summary is broken up into three parts. I would summarize the tutorial. So, so you know, just kind of put in a few final remarks. I, will, I would add in extra resources, if necessary though, okay? These extra resources don't get in often. But one thing that I've been doing the last couple of years is I've been adding in FAQs right down at the bottom. And the FAQs, and I use the FAQs to answer common questions that I get in the comments. Because some of, because some of my blog posts have like 30 or 40 comments and not everyone reads the comments. They will just read half the blog post and be like, oh, this, this, this rubbish doesn't work. And so what I'll do is, if I get the same comment over and over again, I would add it into the FAQs. Hopefully people will notice the FAQs down at the bottom and not, and not spend the time putting in a uh, comment. But I also use the FAQs to, to um, predict questions that I will get, especially while I write blog posts. So in this example, I think the question down here is, I can't see allow each content item to have its layout customized on the default view mode. I actually had this problem when I was writing the blog post and that kind of confused me. And the reason why you can't see that checkbox is because you need to be on the full content view mode. So if I had that problem, chances are someone else would have that problem. So I just chuck stuff in there. And I often use the FAQs to just tell people to, to you know, run Drush CR or Cache Rebuild, because that seems to be 90% of Drupal's problems. You know, they install a module, they can't see something. Did you run Cache Rebuild? Oh yeah, thanks, it's working now. All right, there you go, move on to the next thing. So this is the structure that I use on WebWash. It's not perfect, and I do tweak it from time to time, but by sticking to the same structure, all I need to do is make sure that, yep, I've got an intro, I've got the body. Now, the body of the tutorial is pretty straightforward because all I'm doing is taking screenshots and explaining, you know, click here, click there, select this, select that, screenshot here, you know, screenshot there, done, 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 done. Like, it's fairly straightforward. It's the introductions and the summary is where I, is where I spend a lot of time because I'm trying to sell, especially in the, in the introduction, in the first few sentences, you are trying to sell the, the actual blog post to the reader and hope that they, read, that they read the next line, then they read the next line, and then they read the next line. So once you know what you're gonna write about and you have a rough structure, it's time to get writing, okay? And you need to sit down and write and keep writing until the draft is done. That's kind of like my rule. I like to sit down and write until the draft is done because I often write after hours. And so I will probably have about an hour or two to start write, to, to write at, at night, you know, after nine o'clock or something. And 
when it comes to writing, you can't just switch on and start writing, okay? You slowly get into the hab you know, you so slowly get into the zone and you get, you know, you start writing, start writing, start writing, and then you're productive for about half an hour where you're just, you know, getting words out, getting words out, and then you need, and then you need to go to bed. And so I was trying to do my drafts as quickly as possible because if I don't, then it's going to take a couple more nights and then before you know it, I've spent a whole week and, you know, I've just got a draft done. So try and get your drafts done as quickly as possible. Now, if you're like me and kind of struggle to focus, especially in this connected world, and especially if you write on a computer, you know, you have Slack, you have all these type of notifications. One thing that I've done is I've actually started to write a lot of my introductions, especially if I'm struggling. Now, I don't do, now, I don't do this all the time, but if I'm struggling to just get ideas out, I would write the, dra uh, the introduction to the draft, uh, the, the draft of the introduction on a piece of paper first. And this actually helps me a lot because when you're writing on a computer, because it's easy to backspace and delete words and um, change sentences and all that, you spend more time, you're kind of editing and writing. You're like writing a few words and you're editing. You're writing a few words and you're editing. And you're writing a few words and editing. When, when, in, when in actual fact, you should, you should just write as much as you can and then go back the next day, preferably, and then go and edit. Because it's two different frame of minds, the writing and the editing. So what I often do is I would find a quiet corner. I won't take any devices. I'll just take a pen and paper and I'll just smash out you know, a couple pages. And probably half of it I won't use. But when I type it into the computer, then I'll go in there and clean things up and I'll have to kind of figure out what I wrote because I can't even read my own handwriting half the time. But it just gives me a chance to kind of clean things up um, whereas I write it. And I have been looking for an actual phone. Like if somebody knows of an app that you can just take a photo of and it does like OCR, optical recognition, and it just gets the text out of it in a nice clean way, let me know because I'd love to. Um, I'd love to know if there's an actual app for that. I'm sure there is. I just haven't really searched for it. So, yeah, if you get stuck, try writing on a pen and paper first. So once you've um, written the draft, you've checked the links, you've proofread it. Now, we are skipping a bunch of stuff, but if you've uh, written your draft, checked the links, proofread it, it's time to publish, okay? Now, a few tips here. Do not wait too long to publish it. So, so don't finish your draft, you know, three weeks ago and then decide to publish it. Because, because I have been in situations where I have written a blog post and I've left it in a draft state, ready to go, and the module that I was writing about released a new version, which pretty much made my blog post obsolete. And that kind of gets annoying because you're just about to publish something and then you realize that they've um, pushed out a, a, a release which changes everything. And so all your screenshots are wrong, you know, everything's changed and then you're pretty much publishing an obsolete um, blog post. So always try and, you know, publish, like write it and then release it. And then also congratulate yourself. You know, you've, you've, you've spent the time to write some content and you have published it. And then now you need to promote it. Now this is going to sound a bit, bit salesy. I know that, a bit, a bit marketing, but you want to try and promote your blog post. But this is where I struggle, okay? I hate promoting my, my blog posts. I prefer to just publish it and then move on to the, to the next tutorial because I want to learn about something new. I don't want to sit in social media and promote it and you know, do all that type of stuff. But here, but here are a few things you can do to promote your blog post. You can promote it on social media. That's one way. As I said, um, I don't really like sitting on Twitter uh, that much these days. It's a bit depressing. But what you can do is you can automate most of this stuff. And that's what I do. So there are a lot of tools out there where you can automate um, your social media statuses. And, and honestly, just do that. But as I've mentioned before, like from personal experience, your click-through rate for people reading your tweets and going to your site is very low, honestly. So it's up to you if you want to even be on social, if you want to promote on social media at all. But if you had to, had to choose now, I actually forgot to put a slide about email marketing, but if you had to choose between social media and email marketing, go with email marketing. Yes, there's a bit more effort, but you get way more engagement from your email list. Because if you actually ask for feedback in your email list, people will reply. 
If you ask for feedback on your Facebook page, like you put in a poll saying, what type of content do you want? I think I had one person reply back. And it's kind of like, well, that's useless. But on my email list, I had about 20, or like 20 people send like reply, reply back to me saying, oh yeah, I would love to learn more about you know, Drupal and um, JavaScript or Drupal commas and all that. So work on your email list. Now, another way you can promote your blog, uh, your blog post, and this is specific to Drupal, is try and get your site listed on Planet Drupal. Now, if you go to planetdrupal.org, on this page you will see a bunch of aggregated blog posts from, from about, I think, 400-ish, I think the count is about 450, the last time I checked, of, of 400 websites that write about Drupal. And, and, this, and this page actually aggregates all those blog posts into a single feed. And then, of course, you can, you can connect to an RSS feed for uh, Planet Drupal. Now, to get your website onto Planet Drupal, it needs to be approved. There are a few requirements, like I think you need about four blog posts about Drupal. And also, your feed needs to be a feed which will only display a particular tag, so that you're not posting all of your blog posts to the planet, because, because you should only post blog posts about Drupal to the planet Drupal. Even though I've seen a lot of blog posts that don't even mention the word Drupal in, in the actual body. But this is a good way to promote your site, um, especially if you're writing Drupal, and you will see a bump in traffic. You will see a bump, a bump in traffic. May not, it may not be as much as it used to be. I remember, I remember back in the day, you'd see, a, see you know, at least 100, 100 visits on the day. Now, that may not sound like much, but if you're getting you know, 1,000 visitors a day, an extra 100 is a nice little bump. Now, the final thing I want to mention is content repurposing. Because one thing you'll realize quickly is that writing blog posts takes time, okay? If you want to push out a 300-word blog post with no screenshots and just the basic or, how, or you know, how, how you build this and that, then yeah, that may take you an hour. If you want to, build a, if you want to write a 2,000-word blog post on how to create a React widget and embed that into Drupal, it's going to take you know, five to 10 hours. So what, I, so what I recommend you do is look at ways of repurposing your content because you've already done the hardest part, and that is researching the topic, which is often, can sometimes take longer than actually writing it, and also writing the blog post. So here are a few ideas, okay? You can convert a blog post into an email course, and that's pretty easy. All you need to do is create emails from your sections. So if you have a blog post with 10 different sections, well, then you, then you can convert that into a 10 email, a, a 10 email course, email course, okay? Another thing is an ebook, okay? Um, you can easily, and I actually did this recently, um, Google Docs is, is great for this. If your site is producing nice and, nice and clean HTML, all you have to do is copy all of your text and the images and paste that into Google Docs and the images automatically get uploaded and you have a Google Doc of your article and you have to do just tiny little bit of formatting but then you can export it out as PDF, I think EPUB and Mobi. So there you go, there's a whole ebook without spending hours reformatting things because yes, content repurposing is simple but, you, but, but if you have to reformat a 2,000 or 3,000 word blog post you're gonna probably spend a couple hours doing that. Now, another thing you can do with content repurposing is you can convert your blog post into a slide share. So you can post it onto, well, a, like a PowerPoint slide. So you can then post it up to slide share and then you can get traffic from, the, from, from that. And another thing you can do is, is actually create a video using the blog post text and the structure as a basic script. Of course, recording the video will probably take a fair bit of time and then fixing up the audio and doing all, all that type of stuff. But the blog post can be the, pretty much a basic structure. And that's what I often do. I would write the blog post and then I will create a video using the blog post. And another way you can, you can repurpose your content, and this is something that I did, and coming back to the Udemy course, is I uploaded about I don't know, 50 or 60 videos onto YouTube. And then I realized, well, why don't I just put that on Udemy and make it free? And that's what I ended up doing. And um, luckily, the videos were 
in a kind of a coarse fashion where it was, it was videos about display suite, videos about views, about fields and blocks and this and that. And then I was able to create a free course on Udemy about it. And it's, as I've mentioned, it's helped over 10,000 people. So there you have it. I mean, go out there, create, create blog posts, and by creating great blog posts, you can help others and you can also contribute to open source. Thank you. Thank you. So, so any questions? Come on, there must be one question. Thank you. Don't want to be standing up here. Are you going to publish these slides on your site or yeah. on a GitHub or anything like that? They'd be quite good to reference back, I think. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yes, I will be writing, writing a post about this. It would be terrible if I don't actually write a post about this and put it on the site. Um, yeah, I'll be writing about that probably out next week or something. But I, will, I, think, I've, I think I can actually add it to the Drupal.org, no, Drupal South site. I think I've got edit access to the, um, to the actual Drupal South um, slide page, so I'll put it there. Any, any others? Yep. How long does it take for you to create like a 200, 500-word post? Oh, oh, yeah. How long does it take for you to write a 500-word post? Roughly. Yeah, so if I know what I'm going to write about, which a lot of the times I don't, and, and, it, do, and it doesn't mean that I don't know Drupal, it's just that if I'm using a new module that I've never used, um, then, I'll, then I have to actually look at the code and figure out and look, look, and look at all the back end um, screens and all that. So it will take me about two to three hours. Um, two to three hours to write it. Now, in the past, when I would publish it, I would spend probably an hour and a half going through the whole publishing process because what I'll do is I would publish the blog post, then I would post it on Twitter, Facebook, I've got an Instagram, and I'll do all that manually. Our LinkedIn as well. And then I will write a basic email and send it to my email list. And that would take about an hour and a half, which was very annoying because it would be late at night and I'd have to do all this type of stuff. But I do use a service um, that I do recommend called, called CoSchedule, and that can kind of automate a lot of the publishing stuff. So I actually have a template, and, and automatically when a blog post gets published, I've actually set up a template to to send a status to my personal Twitter page, to WebWash Twitter page, to the WebWash Facebook page, LinkedIn page, and then I've also set it up so that a month from now, it will also do another status update as well, and it kind of automates all that. But I've, I've, I've probably spent, just recently I, I wrote a blog post on using React in Drupal, and that required me actually writing code, and, and actually actually building two basic React applications as a Drupal module, and that took probably five or six hours just, just to write the code, and then I'll put all the code on GitHub as well, and then if I have that, then it can take you know, 12, 12 to 15 hours. When I, when I actually look at the time that I spend, because I do track it all, because I am a freelancer, so I track my time, I do sometimes think about, oh, it's like, oof, this took a lot of time. Oh, it took a lot of time, but you know, it's a, I, do, I do enjoy it most of the time. Sometimes it does get a bit tedious, but yeah. Just, it really depends how much effort you want to put in, really. Yeah. So any, any other questions? Oh, another one, oof. No, go for it, three questions. I think it's better than my last Drupal South session. Uh, I suppose the React in Drupal is a good example, but have you had many blog posts where you had really minimal knowledge of the actual topic you were going to be writing about? And how did that really influence the blog post? Uh, or did it help you learn really. more, I suppose? Yeah. Um, I can't really think of it. Uh, at this point, I, I've mostly been writing about Drupal, and I've got experience in that. The only time, I guess, there's been instances where I, I don't have that much experience with a module, and then I would write something on how to use a module, and then the first comment will be, oh, but you can use this other module which does the exact same thing. And it's kind of like, well, yeah, you can, but you know, the whole thing about Drupal is that you have a lot of options. 
Or another one is I would explain how to do something and then somebody would tell me, oh, there's another backend screen that allows you to do it this way. And that caught me on, that I actually got caught, I actually got caught by that a few times early on, but I've actually learned now to um, always open up the module and have a look at the routing.yaml and have a look at all the backend screens, get your head across all the backend screens and see what can actually be done. Because of course the module doesn't have, very rarely doesn't have any documentation. And one thing that Drupal kind of struggles with, and this is a bit of a rant about Drupal's backend, is that it's actually very hard to discover backend screens in Drupal. I don't know how, I don't know how non-technical or non-coding people do it because I've talked to many people and I do get a lot of comments asking me, oh, I'm a non-developer, how do I use Drupal? And I think to myself, oh, well, I don't know how to explain how to use Drupal without writing code. But I know for myself, I would, I would always open up the module and for Drupal 8, I would look at the routing.yaml and Drupal 7, I'd look at the hook menu and, and try and find out all the backend screens and then get my head around them and then just start playing around with them. And, and I try and make sure, I try and anticipate all the questions I will get. Um, because after you've done it for a while, you know what type of questions you're going to get. Um, so I try and anticipate it all. But, but this more, no, next year, I want to start writing about other things, a lot more of non-Drupal stuff, specifically like JavaScript and um, React and Vue and more cater towards that. So maybe I'll be able to answer that question in a year. <laughs> where I'm not a full-blown expert. Any other questions? No more? Oh, yeah, go. Well, wait for the mic yeah. so it picks up. Uh, how do you go about uh, maintaining blog posts, especially things with, like, React is one I get burnt with a lot, is where you go looking for a blog post oh, and yes. how to do something with React, and it's three months old and completely pointless. So. Yes. <laughs> um, yeah, I think with React, I... Yeah, I, I was learning it back in the day when they just decided to move everything over to ES6. So you had half blog post written in like ES5, then you have half blog post written in ES6, and I was like, what the hell is this? Um, yes, the way I handle it is you have to spend the time. Well, okay, first of all, you can just leave it and be like, oh, forget about it. You know, this content's free. People should, should stop complaining. It's free. It's free content, and don't worry about it. But I can't do that, okay? So Drupal, as I'm sure you're all aware, Drupal 8 has a six month release cycle. Back in the Drupal 7 days, it was easy. You know, there wasn't a new version of Drupal for years. But now with Drupal 8, there's a release cycle every six months. And so I have written, I have rewritten a blog post on media management in Drupal 8 about three times uh, because it keeps changing, which is great. Like, I love the fact that Drupal's getting better and we don't have to wait, you know, years and years and years. And next week, when Drupal 8.8 .8 gets released, there's going to be, um, you can embed media assets directly into the editor. Again, I'm going to have to totally change the, blog, the, the, the article that I've got about media management. Um, but with Drupal 8 content, I do keep track. There is, a, there is an actual page on Drupal.org that, that tracks, um, what is it called, the change request or change, I f forgot the name, the change, change records, that's one, that's one, the change records. So I have a look in that. I, every month or so, I just quickly go in there and see, you can, you can, you, can, you, you can kind of see if there's major changes, like, you know, oh, there's a whole new module in core. Then I go in there, I have a read, it's like, oh, okay, okay, that's good, good. Um, one of the ones that I got, got kind of burnt because I just randomly slipped it in was the bootstrap theme, just randomly in a, in a normal release, removed three starter kit, yeah, starter kit sub-themes that you would use to create a sub-theme. So for the bootstrap theme, which is only Bootstrap 3 at this point, there was a CDN, a less, believe it or not, because it's still Bootstrap 3, which was written in less, and a SAS starter kit. And then, luckily, somebody in the issue queue contacted me directly, somebody like that, that read it in the issue queue saying, oh, the latest dev version of Bootstrap only has one starter kit called just starter kit. And that kind of changed all, like, all the content that I had out there. And this is where content repurposing can become a bit of a pain because then all of a sudden you're like, oh crap, where do I put that blog post? Oh, I'll put it up here, I need to change it here, I need to change it there. But luckily for me, it was a simple few lines going there and change it. But I occasionally get the irate person saying, oh, I followed your blog post, it's crap, it doesn't work, Drupal sucks, and they move on. You know, there's only so much you can do with that. I mean, yeah, I'm not going to bother 
helping that type of person. Or you get the great ones. I, I was going to put a few slides in here with examples of, of comments that I get. Um, people get very angry about panels, oh, I've noticed. There was one person on, on, um, in YouTube that got really angry why panels doesn't work. And he's like, panels is crap. And that's one thing I've noticed that people either love or hate panels. But they, but, but they get very upset about using panels and page manager. And I should have probably put a few comments that I get, because yeah, I've got some funny ones. Like, you know, basic like, oh, I, I install the module and I, and I get a PHP error. And that's the comment. And it's kind of like, come on. It's like, you need to actually help me. And I actually want to write a blog post about about asking help in the comments, you know, what I need to help you out. Exactly, it's, it's, like you, it's like you need to tell me like exactly what you're doing. You can't just say, it doesn't work. So, I hope that answers your question. A long, a long winded rant, yeah. 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 Yes. Yes. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. And and one one thing that I actually did put in here, but I forgot to mention, is that I've actually Googled issues that I've had, and I've totally forgotten that I've actually written about it. And it's like, oh, that's right, I wrote about this module. And it's like, oh, that's how you use it. And so I, I really use this to kind of just document what I've learned because sometimes I feel, especially with Drupal 8, and this is, again, another rant that I kind of have, is like I spend a lot of time trying to figure out what, what service in Drupal 8 is required to do something, where in Drupal 7, everything kind of had a, like a procedural function, and that's all been taken out. And for Drupal 9, it's all been deprecated. And so I spend a lot of time just figuring out how stuff work, and very little time actually doing it together once I know which bit of which service to use. So, so yeah, that's another reason to write blog posts. It's a great way to document what you've learned. And then you'll just Google it and find it yourself. Yes, any other questions? Uh, what was the name of the schedule? Oh, co-schedule. Co-schedule. Co yeah, it's just co-schedule. So yeah. Have a look at it. I don't want this to be like a marketing thing about it. I can show it to you after if you want. Um, it's, not, it's not cheap. It's about 400 bucks a year. But the way I see it, it saves me an hour every time I post. So I can kind of justify it from a business spend, like uh, from a business standpoint, I can justify it. Um, but that's getting into the whole marketing and content marketing, which you know developers normally look, look down upon. <laughs> it's like, oh, that's a marketing department, whatever. Um, yeah, but it's a good tool. I like it. Any others? Anyway, you can catch me wherever. I'll be here today, tomorrow. And yeah, that's it. Thank you. Mm.